I'm here at Oak Creek, Oak Creek, Oregon. Oak, Oak Creek flows through the McDonald Forest, which is owned by Oregon State University's College of Forestry. What I'm standing at the head of is a weir that was used back in 1969 through 72 to measure rates of bed load transport, specifically of gravel. Now, running diagonally across this weir were two narrow trenches with metal plates in them, uh, and they were called vortex samplers. And off to the side, there were places where they could be there with buckets, they could flip these metal plates and suck the sediment out of the trenches into waiting buckets. They would then take those back to the lab, sieve them, that is, put them into stacks of sieves and otherwise sort them into their various size classes and measure the amount of transport and also measure the discharge. So you can see here a staff gauge measuring in feet the height of the water in this weir. And if you've taken direct measurements, then you can relate the stage in the weir to the discharge, that is the amount of water in say volume per time moving through the creek. And then if you know geometry, <laughs> roughness, and stream gradient, can tell you about the shear stress being applied to the bed and thereby acting to move that bed load, that gravel. So this is the place where we have some of the very best measurements, at least at, say, relatively low transport rates in a reasonably natural stream. And I say natu reasonably natural because I'm standing in a concrete weir, so obviously it's not completely natural. but. Um, it is a field setting, it is some of the best data that we have, and those data have been used in sediment transport relationships, uh, specifically that of Gary Parker. The data from this particular site, this spot, define the low end of that curve. If you, if you were looking at a curve of uh, dimensionless transport rate on the y-axis versus uh, dimensionless shear stress on the x-axis it would have a curve something like that and the data from here defines sort of the low end steep part of that curve um, that's why we have come here well, one of the reasons we've come here to do to try a new method of measuring transport rate that we hope can be exported to many streams throughout the world because we still lack a lot of data. The fact that the Oak Creek data set is one of the few data sets that can be used to calibrate sediment transport relationships is testament to the fact that we don't have a lot of reliable data that gives us a wide variety of transport rates um, at a wide variety of shear stresses, at a wide variety of locations for that matter. So here we're trying to test out a new method. Uh, it's not a brand new method, but, but the way we are conceiving and trying to use it to measure sediment transport rates is relatively new. And that method is uh, radio frequency identification, the use of so-called pit tags or passive integrated transponders placed in small pieces of gravel, placed on the stream bed, and then having, and we have antennas in the stream bed. And the idea with our method is that if we know certain things, including the concentration of those tracers that we've placed on the bed, then if we measure the count rate, the rate at which those tracers pass over our antennas, then we can actually calculate a transport rate. So that's the idea. That's the, that's the goal of, of, the, of our using of this technology. It's the same technology uh, that is used in a lot of different applications, including livestock, uh, including pets. So if you have ever, if you have a pet, a cat or a dog that you have so-called chipped, um, we are using that exact same chip, these little glass capsules uh, to put in pieces of gravel. We drill holes in the gravel, 
shove in the tag with epoxy and pack it in there, uh, let the epoxy set, and then we put those tracers in the stream, and we repeat that a thousand or two thousand times. Uh, to date, we've put, um, I'm gonna guess, because I haven't actually calculated the number, about 1,500 of those tracers into Oak Creek. Uh, we still got a number that, of tracers that we are waiting to be deployed, and that's why I don't know exactly how many we've put in. So, um, that's the idea. And the reason we're here at Oak Creek is this is where it kind of all started in terms of where we've got the best data, where we know that we can do a pretty good job of, uh, well, we know, we know pretty well what the, what the transport rate is at a given discharge. So we can compare that knowledge to what we measure. And that's one of the main reasons we're here. We're also here collaborating with a colleague of ours named Catalina Segura, uh, also her collaborator, who I'm gonna mess up his name, Dana. Mm, um, and they're looking at the relationship between uh, primary production on the, in the stream and transport rate. And specifically, they have a student now, and they had a master's student do it initially, and now a, a PhD student who's got a roped off reach of the stream upstream of here. And after events of, of, of rain events, flood events, events where there is likely to have been transport, um, and then at given times after that, you'll measure the amount of slime, paraphyton, algae, whatnot, on the rocks, and see how that's affected by how much transport there is. And you could also imagine inverting that, that measuring the amount of paraphyton on these rocks could tell you about how much transport there has been in the recent past. So it's not, you know, it's obviously not all that simple, but uh, so we can, you know, our studies should be uh, synergistic. That's the, the idea. Um, you know, things that she's doing are helpful for, for us and vice versa. So this is our base of operations in the field where we have our RFID reader in this uh, metal box here. Ordinarily it would be closed. And we've got a, a lock box here, this larger plastic thing. Um, we've got a board in here. In the bottom of the box we've got three, currently three six volt batteries. Um, marine, deep cycle marine batteries to power the system. And um, so there's our reader. Uh, right here is our uh, tablet computer that we use to uh, monitor interface with the system. You can see there I've entered uh, command AD and it's read out to me what the uh, what the power usage of the system is. So um, what the current drawn by antennas one, two, and three are uh, what the effective current for the entire system is, the voltage on the batteries, on the power supply, in other words, uh, and the voltage on the clock battery, and then the time right there. Um, it's also got here at the bottom, it's uh, detected a piece of grab a tracer. Um, this doesn't indicate movement currently, it, it simply indicates that uh, there's a tag, a, a tracer, parked on or near one of the antennas. Up here I've got an oscilloscope, and I've got it hooked up to a pair of the uh, ante antenna terminals right now. So, I'll turn that on, so I can zoom in and out of that signal to see what the, uh, what kind of signal is, is the reader putting on the antenna. So, the way this works, um, the primary element of the guts of this reader is the so-called radio board. And that radio board uh, produces a 134.2 kilohertz uh, ch charge pulse on the antennas at high voltage. I can zoom in and out of this in time. Uh, so if I zoom out in time, you can see uh, the way the 
peaks of the wave get closer together and then form essentially a block. And what we're looking at now is the charge pulse, the duration of that charge pulse and its amplitude. And currently that, currently that amplitude is about one, two, three, four, five, six, 620 volts peak to peak. Now this is all of course uh, on an 18 volt or 19 volt power supply. Uh, so obviously there's some transformers in there and an oscillator creating that radio signal, that radio frequency signal. So with that, I can monitor, uh, I can actually measure what voltage is being put on the antennas uh, the oscilloscope can help me, therefore, with, uh, with tuning. Looking at the details of that waveform, that sinusoidal waveform, uh, can tell me how well the, how, whether the antenna is in tune or not, um, and also its amplitude. So if it's out of tune, then the amplitude of that sinusoidal waveform will be smaller. That is, you know, now it's 620 volts, you know, peak to peak. Uh, you know, less than that, right? It would be smaller. And the waveform itself would not look so pretty. You might have noticed if you could see it, but that the sinusoidal form was really smooth and really nice. Um, but if it's out of tune, it won't look so nice. So we've got the reader, it's got this radio board that uh, puts a broadcast signal on antennas that we, that we have in the stream bed, three of them right now. And, uh, so it broadcasts, you know, with that high amplitude, strong signal. If there's a tracer nearby, the tracer within that glass capsule has a copper coil that is tuned to the same frequency that this broadcasts. And that copper coil acts as an antenna. And then there's a little bitty circuit board in there, a little bitty low frequency transmitter. So a transmitter that, that transmits a digital signal over a range of, uh, I think, 128 to 134 or something kilohertz. I know that the broadcast frequency is 134.2 kilohertz. Uh, the little little tag actually transmits over a range of frequencies, uh, and that's partly how it can tell which uh, which part of the ID it's reading at any given time. Okay, so um, the the, the strong field given off by the antenna induces a current in that little antenna in the tag, uh, charges up a capacitor, and when, that, when it reaches a certain amount of charge, it then transmits. And it says, hello, I'm here, and here's my ID number. When this thing is done with its charge cycle, it turns off and it listens. So it's got to transmit at, say, 24 or 50 watts, I guess, actually. The, uh, we have to keep our effective, our average power use down below, say, 25 watts. Um, but it's, it's on half the time and off half the time, so it's going to uh, be broadcasting at, say, 50 watts. And then it's going to be quiet and listen for these little microwatt transmissions from the little tags. And those tags are simply going to consist of its number, its unique number. And every piece of gravel that we have tagged out there has its own unique ID number. Um, I've got with me my Julia Child moment. I pre-prepared these tracers. So uh, here's one of them. This is in the 8 to 16 millimeter size class. And, you know, just a, a piece of gravel with a hole drilled in it and a tag put in with epoxy. And you can see the white epoxy there. I have recorded this, the, the number of the tag that's in here and the fact that that tag belongs to a piece of gravel of this 8 to 16 millimeter size class. Um, I've got at hand here another one. This is in the uh, 16 to 32 millimeter size class. And similarly, you can see the big white splotch of epoxy there. We've also got two other size classes in the stream, 32 to 64 millimeters and say 64 to 128 millimeters or just greater than 64 millimeters. Uh, so we've got everything from these relatively, you know, pretty small pieces of gravel uh, up to cobbles like that um, tagged. And so when we read a tag number, we know what size of gravel it corresponds to. So let's back up to, to consider how this all works. So say I can 
know with perfect knowledge uh, how many pieces of gravel of a certain size class are moving. I can reason that the, the number of those pieces of gravel that are moving is going to be related to the, uh, say, the, the velocity of the, of the water in the stream and the, the friction coefficient, so the shear stress on the bed of the stream, and the amount of that size of gravel that's in the bed on the surface of the bed of the stream. Let's say I, I don't, of course, have perfect knowledge of how many of those things are moving. I want to put in a bunch of tracers, in this case, what we've done, and then put in antennas to measure the rate at which they pass over the antenna. So then the trick is, okay, well, so say you know with perfect knowledge then how many tracers are moving. You need to know how many uh, untagged pieces of gravel each one of those tracers represents. So for every tracer that passes over the antenna, how many non-tracer pieces do we figure are passing over the antenna? And in order to get an idea of that, we have to know, well, okay, what's the uh, concentration of that size tracer in the bed of the stream? Now, realistically, that's going to be a pretty low concentration, if you think in terms of an area concentration. What's the fraction of the bed area or even the fraction of the bed of the volume of the active layer that is that comprises tracers? So the thing that we're doing that other studies have not done is to try to deploy the tracers in such a way and also to monitor where they end up through time or where they go through time in order to be able to reasonably estimate that tracer concentration. Uh, in an effort to keep that concentration within the, you know, within the range of our antennas, in an effort to keep that tracer concentration relatively constant with time, or at least we hope not varying awfully much over time, uh, we've distributed our tracers um, uniformly over a long distance. So, for example, this year we uh, put our smallest tags, our, our smallest tracers, these, uh, these small pieces of gravel, um, as far upstream as, as 600 meters from that weir that, uh, that I was standing in a few minutes ago. The idea then is, well, if I have a constant concentration of those tracers over a long distance upstream, um, then as they move along, uh, that concentration won't necessarily change all that much with time because as tracers move out of the reach with the antennas, new tracers will move in. Now, that's a nice idea that there are problems associated with it. One of them being, for example, that um, when I first put in the tracers, they are sitting on the surface, or we can even shove them down a little bit, uh, but it doesn't, and it doesn't make much difference whether we simply place them on top or say shove them beneath the bed a little bit. Uh, but what does matter is when those tracers get incorporated into gravel bars and accumulate, uh, say, where other sediment accumulates. So there, you know, this is a gravel bed stream. Uh, there are gravel bars, and some of our tracers are going to end up in those. And over time, uh, you can imagine that if, on average, you've got some depth of gravel that is potentially mobilized. Uh, within a year or 10 years, whatever your time scale, um, that as I feed gravel in up here and it's moving through, it, you know, as I, yeah, I put it in at the, at the top of that layer, but over time as it moves through and it gets deposited in bars and then re-exhumed, it's going to become distributed through that, uh, that layer. Um, so that's one of the outstanding issues, not necessarily something that we figured out how to address, but uh, something that is on our minds for uh, the implications of our measurements. You know, uh, if, I read a, if, I, if I read the passage of a piece of gravel that I know I put 600 meters upstream, I don't know exactly the history of that piece of gravel, but, uh, but the, the farther upstream I put it, 
sort of the more uncertainty in that history. That is, if I detect a piece of gravel that I know I put only a couple meters upstream of the antenna, then I can be pretty sure that that piece of gravel was mobilized from the very surface and, and moved across the antenna. Um, if I've got a piece of gravel that's 600 meters upstream and it has to make its way down here, I, I know less about it. I, know, I, I don't know maybe whether it's uh, spent some time in gravel bars and so on on its way. It gets to the issue of how susceptible to transport or how likely is any given piece of gravel to be moved. Um, if it's right at the surface, it's more likely to be moved. Of course, if the shear stress on the bed is higher, it's more likely to be moved no matter how deep it is. So um, these are some of the considerations. But again, the basic idea is that if we can estimate the concentration well enough, then we can also estimate the transport rate associated with tracers passing over our antennas. Now, Another issue with this is that we don't necessarily detect every piece of gravel that moves across the antennas. For every 50 milliseconds that this reader transmits and then listens for another 50 milliseconds, so for, and then it, it does it for the next antenna and the next antenna, um, so for every, any one of those 300 millisecond cycles, each antenna can read at most one tag. So if there are two tags that are within the range of reading, then the reader is going to record and detect, detect and record only the first tag that responds to its, after its broadcast. So uh, that means that say if I have a, a tag a tracer that's parked at an antenna that is, you know, essentially sitting right next to one of the wires in the antenna, um, that's going to make it difficult and less likely for that antenna to read other tracers that are moving along. And that's an issue. We, uh, in our first year of good data at this site, um, we had, we could look at our hydrograph, that is the stream amount of discharge in the stream is going up and up and so is our, our, our count rate on our antennas. That's also going up and then all of a sudden it just drops. And we look in detail at the data and it corresponds to one of our largest size class, a, a 64 to 128 millimeter uh, size tracer that is going very slowly past the antenna and of course, that larger, um, we were using two different sizes of tags. Uh, there, we've, we've used 23 millimeter tags and 12 millimeter tags, and the 23 millimeter tags have bigger antennas and so have are, are have a, a longer range. They can be detected at a long at a greater distance, and so they're uh, so a slow moving tracer with a big tag is more likely to be read than a fast moving tracer with a small tag. Um, and so that one cobble that took several hours to move across the antenna essentially blocked out nearly all other detections uh, during the peak of that storm event. Um, that was rather disappointing. That's something that we need to account for, um, or at least that affects when and how well we can estimate the transport rate with our instruments. I've mentioned that these antennas need to be tuned. What am I talking about? All right, so here's uh, antenna number two. As you can see, it's in the stream bed. It uh, pan the stream here a little bit. What we have here is a is some wire that is looped inside the PVC pipe that you can see. The ends of that wire come to this tuning box here. So like I said here, the, uh, the ends of the wire from the antenna coming into the, the tuning box. And this, well, tuning box is the box that, in, that contains the tuner for this antenna. In order to have some idea of what I'm talking about, 
it helps to know just a little bit about electronics and electric circuits. So this particular circuit is what's known as a parallel LC circuit, so a parallel inductor capacitor circuit. And these big red chunky things in the, in the tuner are capacitors. Uh, the antenna loop itself is an inductor. So that's the major inductor and the induct inductance of this antenna is uh, I think probably a, around 80 micro henrys. There's, there's also in parallel with the antenna inductor there's a fine tuning a fine tuning inductor here. Why does all that matter? Well a parallel inductor capacitor circuit, a parallel LC circuit, can be tuned so that it is in resonance with whatever frequency is coming into that circuit. So that is the frequency that's being brought in through this uh, twin axial cable here into here uh, will resonate with this circuit if the circuit is tuned. When the value of the inductance and the capacitance has a certain ratio, then the impedance, the effective resistance at that particular frequency, the impedance in an ideal circuit, that is one without resistance, would go to infinity. Since this is not an ideal circuit, the in, the impedance doesn't go to infinity, but it becomes large enough that I can sustain, that when I put that 600 volts on there, it remains 600 volts at a reasonable amount of current. So let's think about this for a second. If I've got some power supply, uh, and if the when the power supply is say disconnected it's at a high voltage and then I connect it to a load that draws current um, if that load has a small resistance it's gonna pull down the voltage on that power supply so that's what what happens for example if you short circuit a battery then uh, well that battery say it's a 12 volt battery it's gonna sit at 12 volts until uh, it dumps all that current through that wire and then that voltage is going to drop to zero or what have you. Uh, if I've got an electronic circuit uh, pow sort of power supply, uh, the voltage on that power supply is going to drop. The voltage is going to become smaller if the resistance across the terminals is, is smaller. So when I tune this, the resistance becomes larger and I can uh, maintain that higher voltage on the antenna so when we're tuning that's part that's essentially what what we do so i can i can tune these antennas and i've got a separate video uh, describing that where i can come out here uh, hook up an oscilloscope to these antenna terminals and measure the peak to peak voltage during the transmit uh, pulse on the antenna and i can fiddle with this stuff there's some jumpers here uh, that determine which of these uh, capacitors is hooked into what sequence so that I can adjust the capacitance. So if you imagine I've got uh, my cable coming in here and coming through uh, this, this, this inductor here and then this inductor. So across this part of the circuit I've got an inductance and then bridging the circuit up here, I've got capacitance. So by changing these jumpers, I can change the amount of capacitance across the terminals, and then uh, I can fine tune it with the little inductor here. Uh, and when I get that as good as it's gonna get, my voltage, the peak to peak voltage that I see on my oscilloscope is gonna be the greatest. So that's how I tune it. The other method we have to tune is the is the tuning indicator, uh, which is a little thing that I can show you when we get back when I get back to the box. So that's what we're talking about. We're, when we're tuning, we are trying to get the this parallel LC circuit into resonance with the 134.2 kilohertz that our reader broadcasts. Um, 
So if I'm if I read 620 volts peak to peak, I believe it was for this antenna back at the box. Uh, if I put the oscilloscope probe here, um, I'm not going to. I'm going to have some uh, attenuation of that voltage through this uh, transmission line here. Um, I, uh, I use the word transmission line with some trepidation. That's a, a technical term in electronics. Uh, our, for those of you who, who are going to nitpick on this, um, this transmission line is too short to engage the uh, for the transmission line effect to be an issue. Um, but anyway, regardless of that, uh, we're going to lose some of that 620 volts peak to peak. By the time we get out here, the, the voltage across these terminals is going to be slightly less, 500-something um, volts peak to peak probably. In fact, I was out here relatively recently tuning these up, so they're actually pretty nicely in tune at this point. Again, this is the antenna, one of the three antennas that we have currently deployed here. Uh, we had antenna number four sort of around in the vertical plane around the mouth of that weir. Um, it didn't work well. It was, a, it was an idea that was probably worth trying. Once the rocks hit that concrete, they move really fast. We got very few detections on that antenna. And so in the interest of, of getting better data and being able to, to cycle through these antennas more quickly, uh, we, we've, we're not powering that antenna. In fact, uh, it's even disconnected we had to cannibalize the cable go to that antenna because the cable to our antenna that's further upstream was severed probably by a rodent or something. Um, so anyway, here's our antenna and the idea is then that we've got our tracers in the stream and they're gonna sort of skitter across the bed and downstream uh, as the rocks are passing by the antenna, then the, the reader records that their number. Um, provided everything worked reasonably well. In real life, uh, we don't get anything close to 100% efficiency from these antennas. That is, there are plenty of rocks that go by that go by undetected. Why? Uh, well, I talked about one of those reasons before. If a big, uh, slow tracer kind of parks here on that antenna wire then it's the closest to the antenna it's going to be often the first to respond it's going to respond sooner than than ones that are moving more quickly uh, across the antenna we're going to read over and over we're going to read the one that's parked here and we're not going to detect the ones that are moving faster uh, and respond later than the parked tracer um, so that's a big, a big reason why we miss some of the rocks that pass the antenna, uh, some of the tracers that pass the antenna, that is. And of course, another reason is simply if they're moving too fast, if they're moving faster than about a meter per second, then it, we're, we're just, we're not likely to read them. Uh, and that's just a back of the envelope calculation. Based. For the tracer to be read, it probably needs to be within the range of the antenna at the beginning of the charge cycle and it needs to still be in the range of the antenna at the end of that charge cycle and through the receive cycle so that it so that this antenna can then receive that tracer's transmission. Um, I believe that one meter per second number uh, pertains when we've got four antennas going. Since we weren't ever getting many detections at antenna number four, we've turned it off so that we can cycle through these ones more quickly and therefore increase the maximum velocity that a tracer can have and still be detected, right? If we're cycling, uh, if our cycle through the three antennas is 300 milliseconds, uh, we're going to read faster rocks than if the cycling is 400 milliseconds or 800 milliseconds or longer.
So I'm back here at the at the reader. Uh, I did want to show you the tuning indicator that I was talking about. Got it. I've got this tuning indi indicator hooked up to the reader, to the radio board on the reader, and uh, I've switched the multiplexing so that it's only using the antenna that I was just at, antenna number two. And this, these LEDs down here at the bottom are supposed to tell me whether that antenna is in tune or not. Uh, right now, the tuning indicator is telling me it's not in tune. It's saying in. What I want is for the green one to be lit up that says OK. Here's one of the cards that shows the settings for the, for the tuner, the jumpers on the tuner. And in means that, I sh that I'm up here and I need to go this way uh, in terms of the, the jumper settings here. Now, I just told you that I'd come out pretty recently and tuned it up and it was pretty good. Uh, and 620 volts peak to peak is, is really pretty good. That's about the best we've ever been able to get. Um, yet this tuning indicator is telling me that I'm not in tune. Well, how do I know that I'm t in tune? How do I know that I couldn't be better? How do I, you know, that, that 620, you know, that I, could, that I could have a much greater voltage on there if I just tried? Uh, well, I have tried. I've gone to the, uh, the tuning box with the oscilloscope uh, and adjusted the fine tuner, uh, that fine tuning inductor on there to try to get the voltage as high as possible. And if I change the, if, <laughs> if I adjust that fine tuner even a little bit relative to its current state, then I know because I did this, uh, that the amplitude of the voltage on the antenna will decrease. 620 volts peak to peak here, whatever I read out there, let's see. So I tuned relatively recently, went out to antenna number two, hooked up the oscilloscope. It was, uh, I, I got a, a voltage peak to peak of 535 volts peak to peak. <laughs> Uh, and with the fine tuner, I was able to get it up to 540 volts peak to peak. Back here at the reader, it said 600, it was 620 volts peak to peak, so the same as it was today when I showed you earlier. I was able to get it to 540 volts out at the antenna. That was the best I could get if I moved that tuner, uh, that fine tuner, which consists essentially, well, it consists of a, of a coil with a ferrite core and you screw that ferrite core in and out of the coil to change the total inductance of that inductor. So if I move that ferrite core just a little bit one way or the other, the voltage will drop below that 540 volts that I measure out at the antenna. Um, so I know it's in tune because uh, kind of the definition of a, of a resonance peak is that when I go out of tune in either direction away from that peak, the amplitude of, the, the amplitude of that voltage drops. Um, so I'm at the peak, but my tuning indicator says I'm not. Uh, kind of a bit of a problem, um, these tuning indicators. Uh, I mean, I'm actually surprised that they're usual, the tuning indicator is usually correct. That is, when I've got the antenna in tune as best as I can have it. Um, tuning indicator usually says okay. This is uh, this is kind of unusual, but um, it's only unusual. It's not unheard of. So I'm not. I'm a little surprised. I'm not flabbergasted <laughs> that it's that it's giving me misleading information. I hardly know anything about what's in the guts of this thing. Without knowing more about what's going on in the guts of this little tuning indicator. Hard for me to know and say to you anything about why it's not giving, why it appears to be giving me wrong information. I mentioned before that we had deployed our smallest tracers as far as 600 meters upstream of the weir, which is uh, a stone's throw to my, that direction here. Um, Right here, I'm standing in front of antenna number three. 
This has generally been our most effective, our most efficient antenna. Uh, how do we know the efficiency? That's, a, that's one question. Uh, and why did we choose the, the distance over which we've deployed the rocks? And what else are we doing here? So, uh, first the efficiency. When we first deployed rocks here, we knew exactly where they were, how many there were, etc. Uh, after the first storm event, we knew how many and which rocks we had detected with our antennas in the stream bed. And also after that first storm event, we came back through with the so-called mobile tracker that is a, a reader that is in a box with a battery and a backpack and we wave a wand uh, antenna to find, to find the tracers in the bed. And we can walk the stream and find out where they are. So after that first storm, and it was a pretty big one, uh, we, we found some number of the rocks. We inferred that the rocks that we had not detected during that mobile tracking had moved down past antenna number three and out past the weir. Given the number that we inferred had moved and the number that we had detected, we can calculate an efficiency. The caveat on that being that, well, maybe we didn't detect with our mobile tracking unit all of the rocks that were still up there in up, upstream of the antennas and if tracers get deposited in a gravel bar and one sitting right on top of another then you're only going to read the one on top especially if if it's in sort of a preferred orientation because there is a best orientation of the coil in the tag relative to the coil of the uh, of the antenna but but essentially, you you know you can sort of lose those tracers that might get deposited beneath other ones. So uh, that efficiency is just is an estimate. Okay. So that's when I say this is the most efficient antenna. Uh, this is where the that fraction of the number of rocks that that we figured did pass over the antenna were detected. Uh, and I can't remember offhand what that number is. It varies according to grain size. Uh, the larger tracers are detected with greater efficiency than the smaller ones, because the larger tracers move more slowly than the smaller ones. Uh, and also at that time, the larger tracers had larger tags, the 23 millimeter tags rather than the 12 millimeter tags. Why did we this year deploy tracers as far upstream as 600 meters from the weir. At the end of the water year, we came back with the mobile tracker and you know went as far upstream as we had deployed tracers and went as far as, I think, a couple of kilometers downstream. And when I say we, I wasn't actually involved in that walking the stream a couple of kilometers. Uh, that was my graduate student, John, and our research assistant, Morgan, who, who did that. Anyway, so <laughs> they went and uh, for quite a ways downstream to try to find the tracers and they found that the 8 to 16 millimeter size class had moved on average uh, something like between 600 and 900 meters. That was on average. That's kind of a long way for gravel. Uh, now the larger size classes had moved not as far but um, but anyway, that gives you some idea. So why 600 meters? Well, about 600 meters upstream of here is a culvert. I didn't think it was a good idea to put tracers upstream of that culvert. Well, we know it's a barrier to fish passage. It may also be a barrier to tracer passage. So we worked our way down there, put tracers starting at, you know, say about 600 meters upstream of here. Uh, the smallest tracers, I believe we put in every three meters. Um, the, the, the next two larger size classes, the 16 to 32 millimeter and the 32 to 64 millimeter tracers, uh, we started somewhere downstream of that. I can't remember the precise distance. Uh, we put those in every half meter where we put them. Uh, so those are relatively more concentrated, but over a shorter, uh, substantially shorter distance than the 
smallest traces, which tend to move the fastest and the farthest. What's up with the bridge? And uh, what's up with the thing sticking down into the water? On the bridge is a so-called ISCO sampler, actually two of them, those barrels there. The tube down here, there's, there's, two, there's tubes going from each of those down into the stream, and there's an intake. At intervals, a sample of the stream water is sucked up through the tube and stored in the barrel, and then there's a big sort of lazy Susan in there that shifts and then uh, the next sample will go into the next vial. So a bunch of empty uh, plastic jars, plastic bottles in there that then get filled with, uh, with samples of the stream water over time. Um, and of course you record at what time those samples were taken. And in addition, there are pressure transducers uh, located at, at different spots, one of which is in the in a pipe down at the weir and those are recording at intervals so when we go back and look at those data we know what how high the stream was and we can infer from that what the discharge was so once the samples from the sampler are taken back to the lab you you can measure the turbidity of that water or you can even filter the water to to measure how much uh, sediment is uh, you can filter out of the water so that you can get a relationship between the discharge that you're measuring with the pressure transducer and the concentration of sediment in the water sampled with the, the ISCO sample. From concentration and discharge, you can get suspended sediment transport in volume or mass per time so that you get a relationship, say, between that, sus that suspended sediment transport rate and the discharge rate or the, uh, the, the shear stress that you infer from the discharge and so on. Another video of mine shows Sammy and I believe his name was Colin sampling bed load at this bridge. So another, and maybe the best reason for having the bridge here is that it gives you a platform, literally, from which to you know, lower instruments into the stream um, across the entire width of the stream, even if the flow is too great for it to be safe to get into the water. They sample the bed load, that is, the stuff moving along the bed, whether it be sand or gravel or even finer stuff. The sampler is a rod with a steel rod or some metal rod attached to a metal collar and trailing from that metal collar is a mesh bag and they stick that thing down on so that the bottom flat part of that metal collar is down on the stream bed They hold it down there for two minutes, uh, allow sediment to accumulate in the bag. They bring it back up, they move over one foot, and they repeat. And they have done that at various stages of the stream to see, to try to get a, another measurement of how, of that bed load transport rate as a function of discharge and shear stress and so on. It's a function of the flow. Last week or something like that, I was out here uh, dropping tracers into the stream to try to see whether those were moving uh, based on my antenna uh, detections. And After I had been checking those tracers into the stream and before any of those tracers were detected at, at this antenna, they were out here sampling bed load. So that's actually pretty awesome. We've got uh, potentially two direct measurements of, of movement or lack thereof of the gravel in the stream. As it turned out, uh, I did detect two of the tracers that I chucked in about two hours after I had chucked them in. Uh, two of the smallest tracers, so I chucked in uh, several 8 to 16 millimeter tracers and I chucked in several 16 to 32 millimeter sized tracers and two of those 18 to 16 millimeter size tracers were detected at this antenna about two hours after I chucked them in. So here I am at antenna number one. 
I wanted to just describe briefly how we go about deploying the tracers. I've shown it in uh, at least a couple of videos. So we'll, we'll walk the stream with, say, three buckets of tracers. Here's the, the bucket of the smallest ones. Usually be something like three of us. We'll be trailing a hip chain with a box of a spool of thread that's looped around a wheel inside the box. And you tie the thread off and you walk along and the thread pulls out and it ticks a ticker that tells you how many meters you've gone down to tenths of, it's calibrated down to tenths of meters. Uh, so we'll have somebody with the hip chain. So yeah. we have hip chain. Yeah. Just which is why we all keep our distance from you. Yeah. <laughs> because we don't want to get tangled in your thread. No. We'll have the mobile tracker. No. Mobile tracker. Mobile tracker. And we'll have the tablet computer. And I have the tablet. And of course, the, say, three buckets of rocks of the different sizes that we're putting in that day. Small rocks. More rocks. Let's see what's in your buckets. More rocks. More rocks and rocks, and these all have tags in them. Um, so we'll decide on some interval for the deployment of the tracers. That is, do we want to put them in, in the case of these, do we want to put them in every three meters? Or in the case of some of the others, do we want to put them in every half meter? Or what have you. We'll keep an eye on the box, on the, on the, on the hip chain measurement. And so at those distance intervals, we'll pull a tracer of the appropriate size out of the bucket, read it with the mobile tracker, record the number that uh, we see on the tablet computer in our logbook. I have our field notebook of all of our stops, distances, yeah. the tracking numbers. Yeah. Also, we'll log that, those detections to a file on the computer. Yeah which is logging all of the tracking numbers. So we have two records, both one written and one computer. We record the distances at which we put in the, the tracer. So we have a record showing, you know, this, this number was put in at this distance. And that number corresponds to a, te to a rock of this size class. So that when I look at detections at the fixed antennas, including this one, I know where that tracer was initially deployed. If we've had any mobile tracking uh, between that time of detection here and that initial deployment, then I also have a record of where we detected it before. And I know when we deployed it, and I know when we detected it here. In addition to using this system to measure the rate of gravel transport. We also have other information such as how far do pieces of gravel move in a given uh, event or set of events. And w at whatever time we later come back and do mobile tracking, we record the distances at which we find the various tracers and we can go back and get a distribution of distances that gravel of, that, of the different size classes moved between deployment or when they were last detected and the latest mobile tracking. So long and short of it is that we get, a, we get a wealth of data from this system uh, while our primary purpose is to try to figure out how to use this to measure transport rate. We also get other information that helps us learn about sediment transport in gravel bed streams. So I hope this video has been helpful and informative. Uh, if you're interested in using RFID, radio frequency identification, we have other videos. I've posted other videos, for example, one about the process of making the tracers. Uh, we've got videos showing deployment of the tracers in the stream. Um, got a tra I've got a video talking about how to tune the antennas with the oscilloscope. Uh, also, we have posted online a what we are calling rather ambitiously a comprehensive manual for the purpose 
which gathers a bunch of material from all the various manuals. It describes how to use the Oregon RFID system that we're using. Oregon RFID has in their online catalog a new multi-antenna reader. When we've contacted them, they've said that it should be ready and on the market soon. It seems it's always six to eight weeks away. And as of the last time I checked, which was a few weeks ago, uh, it was still not for sale yet. They do have a new single antenna reader. The idea with their new generation of readers is to solve some of the problems that we've encountered with this system, such as that the clock doesn't keep very good time uh, and it's not synchronized to a standard reference time. So they've got GPS units in their newer models so that it's getting time from satellites. Uh, the multiplexer in this particular reader is kind of lousy. I guess the Warren from RFID said that the joke is it was designed by an intern. You know, there are basic design flaws that it has. He doesn't claim it's any better than it is and he's, he's worked on an improvement and so uh, the new multiplexer will be featured in the new multi-antenna reader. Uh, it will be more expensive than the one that we bought but it should be quite a bit better. Um, nevertheless, he has said he will continue selling the system that we have, you know, essentially for those who recognize its shortcomings, want to use it anyway. Some of the things that we address in our comprehensive manual and the videos, uh, some of those things may be solved by the next generation reader, some of them won't necessarily be. Uh, issues with the multiplexer, uh, that are traceable to the multiplexer should be solved by the new reader. One of the major issues that we used to have with this system that we are not currently having, when we've talked to Warren at, at Oregon RFID about some of the problems we've had with our system, he said it's the fault of the multiplexer. Um, other things I've looked at have led me to believe that it is a thing called um, mutual coupling in antenna arrays so that even so that antennas that are within a fraction of a wavelength of one another can interfere with one another such that that mutual coupling affects the impedance of any one of the antennas because the other antennas are somehow drawing power even though only one power one antenna should be drawing power uh, some of that coupling may be due to issues with the multiplexer rather than uh, simple coupling of the antennas. But the fact is that there have been times when we are, our antennas are relatively have been relatively close together and instead of drawing one or two amps as they are supposed to draw from the power, instead they are drawing 10, 12 or more amps. Uh, which is which will fry the reader, use up battery power like crazy um, if it didn't fry the reader. So um, here at Oak Creek, we have not had that problem, we think, because our antennas are far enough apart and perhaps the orientations relative to one another, as I wave my hand, uh, perhaps the relative orientations also matters. Again, I don't know exactly why that problem has occurred, but it is something that people should be aware of. There are people who have tried to use this system and not been able to use this system with multiple antennas. Uh, some colleagues of ours from University of Texas had that problem. Uh, they, they had a system up deployed in Idaho and it didn't work for them. They had to, they couldn't get more than one antenna to work per reader. They had two readers. Um, they had them synchronized, but what they didn't realize is that even though when you synchronize the two readers, it is firing the slave reader at uh, according to the clock of the master reader, but the time recorded at, for detections of the slave reader is done according to the slave's clock. 
So even though the readers are synchronized in terms of their transmission and reception, they're not, their clocks aren't synchronized. And so, and these clocks, the clocks in these readers are not very good. There's quite a bit of drift of the time and there was enough drift between their two readers that they couldn't even use these two antennas that these two readers that were synchronized to get the travel time of gravel moving from one antenna to the next, which was a real shame. Um, we have addressed that issue. We're using three antennas with one reader. And by the way, it is a reader that we inherited from them. Uh, Joel Johnson at University of Texas at Austin was uh, after his experience with RFID was all done when the project was over and uh, shipped his readers to us at no charge. Thank you, Joel. You're awesome. Um, I, I, you know, thank you, Joel, but I, I also figure that he was ready to be all done with that friggin' system. Um, we've continued to beat our heads against the wall until we figured out or just either we figured out how to make it work or we got lucky and uh, I won't I don't necessarily know which one issue I think is worth mentioning we are running longer lengths of cable than are recommended by the various manuals uh, definitely the Texas Instruments manuals I can't remember perhaps also the Oregon RFID manuals so uh, that is uh, if we were to follow the guidelines provided by Texas Instruments and Oregon RFID, it seems likely that our system would not work. In order to get it to work, one of the things we have done is violate those guidelines. Um, and so I just wanted to add that in, in the interest of, uh, you know, again, emphasizing the degree to which these systems are not particularly consumer friendly, uh, user friendly, they're not consumer grade electronics, they don't always work predictably. Um, these systems are kind of difficult to use. It, anyway, hope this has been helpful and informative. Uh, you know, press like and subscribe and all that stuff if you want to see up more videos and press the notifications thing if you want to be notified when I post new videos. Uh, my video posting is highly irregular. I've posted you know, several videos relatively recently, uh, but before that it had been about a year since I had posted a video about RFID. So um, I guess partly that's to say if you push, if you subscribe and, and set it to notify you when I post a new video, you're not going to be inundated with a whole bunch of videos. Um, you would get notified every time I post a video of my son's soccer games, but you know, there you go, that's it. <laughs>